Andy Campbell! It's in! Campbell comes off the bench to be a hero! A superhero! Hey guys, I'm Sai, and welcome to the Andy Campbell Show, and this is Ace Podcast Nation. On the channel, we have interviews, content, and podcasts on all sorts of subjects from mental health, MMA and boxing, films and TV, and of course, many other series and shows exclusive to the channel. We've had uh, boxers, MMA fighters, footballers, actors, bands, uh, doctors, all sorts of people, and uh, of course... You can find all the shows at youtube.com slash acepodcastnation, or you can get the audio versions at your usual podcasting and radio apps. And uh, just quickly before we go into the the nuts and bolts of the show, as uh, regular viewers will know, I've been uh, growing my hair out for a good 18 months so that I can donate it to the Little Princesses Trust charity who make wigs. Uh, for children who have lost their hair through uh, cancer treatment or other medical conditions. Uh, That's happening tomorrow. I'm having my hair cut tomorrow where the hair will be donated. Uh, I'm also trying to raise some money for uh, the Minds charity, which is a mental health charity which helps people with mental health problems, uh, particularly for people who are in crisis. They're very good. They're, They're excellent at what they do, and they give great support to people. So if anyone would like to donate before I have all my hair cut off tomorrow morning, then uh, feel free. The link will be in. It's on the podcast page and everything. But I'll. I'm sure my lovely wife will drop it in the comments as well. Uh, but yes, and thank you, of course, to everyone who's donated so far. There's been uh, plenty of people who've got involved. Uh, but with that out the way, first I will welcome my uh, my usual partner in crime. He is former Cardiff City, former Middlesbrough striker, the goal collector. Mr. Andy Campbell, how are you, sir? I'm excellent, mate. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. Can't wait. Yeah. Me my too. First question, my first question, mate, has got to be: Is uh, is Mehmet looking for a new striker? To be, to be fair, after yeah. after, after be video, so <laughs> well after the, after that, yeah, so, yeah. I can so well, I can tell you, there's a lot of comments already. So, of course, of course joining myself and Andy is uh, none other than Cardiff City Chairman, Mr. Mehmet Dalman. How are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you, and thanks for having me on the show. Thank you for coming. And uh, yes, we're looking very. F- we got lots to talk about, of course. There's so much going on in the in the world and the world of sport, and uh, there's many things for us to discuss. Uh, but first of all, I just wanted to ask you, like, how you've how you've uh, kept yourself busy during lockdown and this strange period over the last eleven, twelve weeks. Yeah, it's 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 been a surreal really uh, the whole experience is is, is quite unique um, I like to say that a lot of positive things will come out of this one, one certainly hopes so I just hope that in two years from now we don't just forget it and go back to our old ways um, but no it's been it's been an interesting time <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's a strange one isn't it it's I, no one's used to it no one's no one knows what to do in some ways but also i think i'd like to think that the world will be a better place maybe people will change some of the things about their lives and the things they do but i'm not entirely sure uh, that'll be the case but most of all i'd like to get back to normal first and foremost um so obviously the football season is coming back it was uh, announced i think it was yesterday or maybe the day before that the championship season is coming back um like, how do you feel about that personally and, yeah, personally first and then, I guess, professionally as well? I think playing this season out, I think, is the right thing to do. I think I've been quite vocal about that for some time. Whether it is the right time or not, we just going to have to trust the uh, various bodies to make that decision. And I'm 100% certain they wouldn't make that decision if they didn't think they could do it safely. Um, I think it would have been a tragedy and a travesty if they decided to call it a day and not play any more games till the end of the season. So I'm glad that we are going to play the rest of the season out. Um, 
not just the fact that you know we're two points away from playoffs and we, we think we have a shout but you know teams at the bottom teams at the very top i think leeds and uh, west bromwich albion have put in an enormous effort and performance i think it'd be a great shame if they didn't have their moment yeah i think so do you feel though that um the fa perhaps has been so uh focused on getting the premier league you know started and and well, restarted and back up that the the football league and the championship have almost been i feel as if they personally i feel a, a, almost as if they've been a bit disrespected uh, and a bit of an afterthought how do you do you do you view it similar or, or not i feel a lot more strongly than that i think the leadership in in football has been absolutely awful when you look at the fa the premier league the lma the pfa the efl you know, we win a lot of them. They just don't seem to be able to make a decision. And and that is a travesty, in my opinion, for the sport. Um, and, you know, I've been quite vocal about this. You know, one day, it, next Wednesday, we're going to announce something. Next Friday, we're going to announce something. And nothing happens. Um, we, we really do need proper leadership in those organizations. Otherwise, I think the game is in dire straits. Yeah. So obviously, remember though, you'll you'll have obviously spoke to uh, chairman of the football club, CEOs of other clubs, and so what's what's been like the, the the conversations between yourselves? Have you all been pushing the same direction? Have you all just been waiting and wondering what's going to happen, or have you all tried to push in a certain direction? I think I think we're forced to push in the same direction because at the end of the day, the reality of economics uh, kicks in. You know, you cannot sustain a cost base, which certainly the championship clubs are facing, without having to readdress some of the issues that are blocking our way forward. And and I think there is unanimous um, feeling that we do need to do something. Where the difference comes, of course, is what those actions should be. Um, you know, we again, I've, this this whole question of deferrals, I think that's just a red herring. I mean referrals doesn't help anybody at the end of the day you're still going to have to write the checks out and you're mm -hmm. still going to have to balance your books um so i think this is a great time for the football body to really sit back and say look it, it's time we had a good look at this industry and how we could actually reform it i always draw the analogy between the city of london in the 80s and football you know the city of london had no real regulation to speak of um i probably be shot down for that but you know we needed a big bang as they called it at the time to reform the whole london stock exchange and the way we did business and this is a great opportunity for them to sit back and say how can we best structure the football where championship and the lesser leagues league one and league two has a fighting chance so i just hope that they don't miss out on that well we've been uh, beating the jumps haven't we for well all season, really, about uh, about the consistency throughout the leagues. That that, that I've always been um, of the of the thought process that that the, cha that the Premier League um, filters into the, the Championship, the Championship filters into League One, League One filters into League Two, and then League Two filters into the non-league football and part-time football. Whereas, um, obviously, uh, from Step Six downwards, got cancelled straight away uh, without even the thought of promotions, relegation, everything was voided. Um, and then obviously, and then we've been getting um, snippets of things and then all of a sudden League Two all vote to cancel, um, probably more of a financial uh, decision than anything that that, um, that obviously wages, um, tests. Um, I, I listened to an interesting um, interview with a Port Vale chairwoman um, who was very honest, very upset at the decision because... They had an op a massive opportunity about getting promoted, but she just couldn't see a, a, a financial um, a way around of, of continuing the season. She just couldn't afford to, to continue it. And, and that's been my only concern, that the league hasn't supported uh, the lesser clubs. And uh, my worry is, is it happens to a Berry again. You know what I mean? That another club ends up folding and we, and we, and we lose another club or more clubs. Yeah. Unfortunately, I think that's going to be the case, though. I, I just cannot see how some of these clubs um, can survive. I just don't, can't see it. Yeah, particularly with no gates, um, <clears throat> no merchandise, or, you know, on the day merchandise and uh, food and drinks and things, which, you know, these clubs in the lower leagues, they depend so, you know, that's their main income is tickets and, and uh, match day money. Um, do you think that now would be 
the time for football as a whole to maybe think about things like salary caps um, to try and bring the finances under control because obviously, as everyone knows, the, the money involved in football is incredible. Uh, it's to the point it doesn't seem real at some point, you know, in some in the really big deals. Uh, do you think this is an opportunity for football as a whole? I think it's an opportunity that they shouldn't miss. Will they, though, is the question, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a whole different qu question. <laughs> look, let's just look at the facts for a second, right? If you look at the Premier League today, they're probably sitting on a pile of cash or what, to the tune of 1.5 billion. Now, how much of that money filters to the lower leagues? Yet it's the lower leagues that makes the Premier League, at least to a certain degree, as exciting as it is. You know, we say the Premier League is the best in, in Europe, and it probably is the best in Europe, if not in the world, in my view. But we play a role in that. You know, League One going into championship, championships going in there, and relegation and so on. Yet none of that money really filters down. So, you know, you really have got to have a look at that. Then you've got to look at the whole agents and how the agents operate and the fees that they charge. You know, I know that's a can of worms and we don't want to particularly go there, but it does need reforming. It, it needs to be addressed. But players also have got a responsibility to, um, especially in this, you know what I mean? Obviously, there was a story came out today, which uh, obviously we, we touched on early before we came on, but I, I was absolutely disgusted reading it, that there's three Charlton Athletic players who have decided to not take part in the rest of the season playing for Charlton Athletic. Um, one of them is due to a financial uh, dream move. So Lyle Taylor said that he's not going to play for Charlton Athletic um, due to his dream move and that falling down. And for an ex-Middlesbrough player, um, I see that as good news because Middlesbrough have a better chance of staying up if Charlton get relegated because it it sees another another team through that trap door potentially. Um, but professionally, as an ex-player, I just see so many wrong things with it. And you know what I mean? And, and I look back at Troy Deeney. Troy Deeney's took so much stick over the last four to five weeks that he's refused to play for health reasons of his son and now you've got a player who's not playing for financial reasons by himself it just doesn't sit right with me so uh, what's your thoughts on that i mean look I, anybody who doesn't want to play because of health reasons and concerns about the virus i will support all the way because at the end of the day we're talking about life and um and that's important people not playing despite the fact that they have a contract that obliges them to honor it, I think needs to be addressed. I mean, far as I'm concerned, whoever this player is, he's, he's in breach of contract. Now, his view is, that's fine, cancel my contract. I only got another six weeks ago. Mm. But again, you know, the governing body needs to step up and address these things. Why can't they be penal penalized for this sort of behavior? It's not fair on Charlton. Um, it's a club that I know a little bit about. Um, it's not fair on Charlton, it's not fair on Lee Boyer, who's put in an enormous amount of work there. Um, yeah, I, I think if I if I was that boy, I would not be very proud of myself. I also don't think it's fair in the league as well, Mehmet, that um, potentially Charlton could have an impact on Cardiff City getting the playoffs. And if Lyle Taylor's playing against um, Nottingham Forest and he's got more chance to score a goal, that, had, that would have an impact on you getting the playoffs. And it just doesn't sit right with me that the league can get involved and if the league can't do anything about it, they go to the next step higher. You know what I mean? Because players could be banned from playing football until contracts are, are, are sorted oh, out and, not, and, and they're unbreached. Yeah, but that, that's, that's my point. You, you really got to have almost a czar of football to you know, run, it, run a whole analysis of football and how we can restructure it. It just isn't there. So who's, whose fault is that then, Mehmet? In your, in your opinion, you know that, I, that we've been quite critical uh, on the EFL because I don't don't think um, oh, I'd love to know if you know the answer to this. That the, the the people who run the leagues is is the person running three leagues? Is there different people running League Two, League One, Championship? It's a it's a it's spaghetti junction. Right? It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. <laughs> it's, it's a spaghetti junction. I mean, two is. I mean, one job that I wouldn't wish on anybody is to be the chairman of the FA. It's, not, it's an impossible job. It really is. Um, but, you know, when you look at, you know, we have a Minister of Sport. It would be nice to get the Minister of Sport involved and have some say about this. Yeah. Um, but there is really, apart from guidance um, and a very flimsy one at that, there is nothing else. No. I Sorry, and I was just going to ask if the FA 
have been or the the championship have they been in regular contact with with the you know with the clubs with the chairman regarding the restart to the league or has it just basically been yeah. you guys waiting for them to say right we're starting no no that's, that would not be fair they've been constantly in in, in touch and there's been a lot of dialogue going on but quite honestly i wish there was less contact and more substance okay if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. So then, what about um, players and remember the, the obviously the, the EFL and the, and, the, and the football authorities talk to to you guys. But then, do the players do the players get a say if they're coming back? I know they do it obviously individually about health reasons. But has there been some kind of vote between clubs and players, or or, or is it just taken as a gospel that the players will just play? Um, it's a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, I think the players are looking for guidance. Um, this is where the PFA, I think, has a role to play, which mm. hasn't played yet. Um, of course, they have their own individual views, um, but the majority of them are very supportive. I think their concern is the same as yours and mine, safety. Safety first before anything else. Um, as long as they feel that the club has done the right thing in terms of safeguarding the players and those people involved. And don't forget, there's a lot of people involved in putting a match on. I think 200 people are involved. Um, I think the players have been supportive. Do you, um, do you think uh, football as a sport, and maybe sport generally, because I know they announced earlier this week that sport was coming back uh, generally, do you think that the, we're putting sport ahead of human lives and safety when there's a pandemic with no you know there's no vaccine there's no cure um is sport really that important well again i, I did an interview at sunday times last week where I, I sort of did that analogy of the movie but you're all you're, you're too young to remember this but there was a movie called uh jaws um i remember I, Jaws. I yeah, I remember Jaws. Yeah. Yes. I just look young, I just look. Yeah, young. I was going to say. <laughs> but, but you know that scene where the mayor of town is saying it's safe to go back in, and the yeah. sheriff is running around saying it's not safe to go in. Mm. It's it's one of those things right now. The way I look at this, um, I mean, removing the lockdown and so on, and that's that's a calculated and a well thought out reason. I have faith in that the government would make the right decisions. Um, of course, if you felt that there was one iota of danger to any player or staff, you shouldn't play it. It's, it's a sport. It's, it's, it's football. We, we, we'll, we'll play football to 10 years from now, 20 years from now. But when people die, you can't get them back. So, so how's, um, how, well, how's, how's the government then um, justified and obviously talk to, to use a football club and the football authorities? Obviously, the, the lockdown period in Wales is different to the lockdown period in England. So... You know, with with obviously Cardiff City playing in the English League, um, have Cardiff been able to train earlier than obviously the lockdown's obviously still still quite rife there, isn't it? Where in England it's obviously been a little bit more relaxed over the last uh, couple of weeks, and obviously teams are being back training now over uh, or probably a longer period of time. So how has that affected the Cardiff City players? Well, look, um, I mean Boris Johnson's view at the very beginning of this epidemic, right before it became a global thing was common sense. You know, he, he went on TV and said, look, guys, you know, we're not going to do all these things. We're not going to ban you from doing it. Just be sensible. You know, he he took that view. It cost us three weeks before he changed his views and we went into a lockdown. We can criticize for that, but he does ask for common sense to 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 be employed. Now, when it comes to, to us at this very moment, you know, I think every club needs to be common sense about this thing and um, and they need to make decisions what is right for their players and for, for the club as a whole. Safety is paramount. You know, we I do not want to read anywhere one person, you know, suffering fatalities due to the fact that we've gone back into this game. Yeah. Um, and yes, you know, have we been able to train better than anyone else? Probably not. Um, but I, all I can tell you is our players were very happy to be back on the training ground. I think, I think they were dying to get back onto the training ground. And, and there's a great spirit at the moment. Uh, yeah. So I'm told I've not spoken directly. Um, what, so, um, sorry, sorry. Um, I was just going to ask, what was the reaction? Um, obviously, it was reported uh, over the last couple of days that a member of staff at the club has tested positive for COVID-19. Like, what's the reaction within the club when you hear that? 
when you know obviously as things have started to come back back to working and back to normal and then someone does test positive that must have a an impact on the general feeling around the club how people you know feel emotionally i guess as they're going about their day-to-day business in a difficult time yeah i mean look just because you tested positive it doesn't mean to say you know the disaster is about to happen of course. um i mean at the end of the day very few people suffer fatalities despite the fact that we're coming up to forty thousand of deaths in it in england yes indeed one of the uh supporting staff uh tested positive and he tested for igc as opposed to igg um which means that he at the moment currently has the virus so you isolate him you quarantine him and you treat him um he'll probably be better in time at home i don't think he's gonna end up in a hospital of that nature um i think if you then begin to have more than one or two then i think you have to ask serious questions whether this infection has spread to other people or not um so that's the way you would have to handle that so what's the uh, what, what what's what's put in place to, to to make sure that doesn't happen or you know what i mean to make sure that that's not a possibility then look in, in any in any field in this virus the key is test test and test and that's a direct quotation from the president of the of who you know that's the best thing you can do is continuously test people and is that is that cost is that cost effective for the football club does the football club have to pay or is the or is it getting yeah. subsidized by somebody else um look nothing is cost effective right i mean clubs at the moment are writing checks for whatever reasons and there is no discussion about bailing them out or taking aid or anything it's 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 club has to do that it's as simple as that wow. we're not talking about large amounts of money we're talking about small amount of money i mean a test kit is about 50 pounds so it's, it's not a huge amount of money 200 times 50 pounds i think it's money well spent yeah um well we're talking about money i obviously uh i read a story at the uh well right at the start of lockdown uh about the about the players taking a taking a pay cut um obviously for the football club so what's your thoughts on the players and and the players obviously willing to willing to do that for the football club and the fans well first of all no football player at cardiff has taken a pay cut all right okay so let's be very clear about that okay, right, okay. um they've all voluntarily have taken the deferrals and earlier right, okay. on earlier on i told you what i think of deferrals yeah full stop yeah ah, okay so long to, long long term then that money will be um obviously paid back to each individual who's put their name forward for a deferral absolutely They're, i mean contractually we are obliged to do so they have a contract we're an honorable club and we will honor it absolutely now, how, I does, think... now, how does that help the club or how does that help the nhs is a whole different discussion right mm-hmm. yeah i guess if you've got to pay the money anyway it doesn't make a massive amount of difference if it was paid as it was supposed to be, you know, as it was due, or a little bit later. But it sounds as if the the reasons for doing it were the right reasons. Doing what? Uh, take. Uh, did the players ask for the deferral, or did the club ask the players for the for the to do the deferral? Um, they asked for deferrals. Okay. Um, I personally, I would have said to them, "No, thank you." I would have just carried on. Okay. So who who would have made that decision ultimately? Me. Okay, <laughs> because look, it, it helps with the cash flow. It's it's a, it's a consensus-driven decision, and at the end of the day, you know, everybody's got to do their bit, and they've done their bit. It will help our cash flow, not without any help to us. Um, but you know, it's not sustainable to have a business or any enterprise where your cost base remains static and your revenues just drop off a cliff. It just doesn't work. You know, I think it was Gary Lineker who sort of criticised the media by saying, why don't they pick on CEOs of companies? Um, why don't they, they pay, pay cuts and so on? Well, the CEO of companies, they work. They're actually working. They're generating revenues. And they get paid on what is called a bonus. So if they actually make money for the company, they get paid. That doesn't apply in football. No. No, I guess it doesn't. So then, so, so, so then, long sorry, Sai. So then, um, obviously, as the as the league or the or, or anybody within football given a, a decision about about revenue and about income, that obviously there's going to be no supporters in this season. 
Um, so has, have they got an idea about about bringing in um, some kind of support for, for, for next coming season? So obviously you can look at season ticket sales or some kind of ticket sales to bring revenue in? Your guess, your guess is good as mine. Yeah, well, it just doesn't, just doesn't add up, though, does it? It doesn't make sense that, 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 that football football supporters want to watch football. You know what I mean? And obviously, football clubs need the money. You know what I mean? I'm probably not talking championship uh, who do need the money. I'm not saying they don't need the money, but it's, it, like we go on about lower leagues, that these kind of lower league sides are, are obviously going to get ruined and, and they are going to have to fold or, or, the, or the league's going to have to change into a north-south divide sooner or later if they're not careful because of yeah. travel-wise and, and, and lack of funds and lack of money, lack of income. Look, I can't talk about other clubs, but I can tell you we're burning just shy of three million pounds a month with no revenues coming in. How long can we sustain that? I would imagine not long. Because your next question is going to be somewhere in the show. He's going to say, to you, well, what sort of budget are you going to have for the summer? What kind yeah. of budget are you going to have for the summer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. <laughs> it's just the words right out of my mouth then. <laughs> the more money I burn, less money I'm going to have. Of course. Um, so, just as you mentioned, the summer, uh, Reese David Evans in the chat just asked who uh, who is part of the transfer committee at Cardiff. As uh, in his opinion, some of the transfers have been questionable uh, with the money or the reported money spent. Uh, give me an example. Okay, uh, Reese, give us an example of that. But who is on the, who's the, who's on that? To the transfer committee in terms of making this final decision on signings. Let's let's just go back to the history of this transfer committee. Why there is a transfer committee, right? Because I set it up. Um, okay. So if there's anybody to blame, it's 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 me. When I came on board as chair, club was in turmoil with the Malky Mackay and the club dispute that was going on at the time. And we're not going to go into the merits and demerits of that argument. But one of the key points there was the transfer policy, that the owner didn't know who he was buying. And then the manager was saying, well, I didn't know who the owner was buying. And therefore, you know, I was getting players that I didn't want. And he was saying, you're overspending in the transfer market. So I said, look, guys, we're going to have a transfer committee, which is going to have the representative of the owner. It's going to have the manager who will have a veto right on any player coming in and me, and I'll try to play the neutral role in this. So we now have a platform where every single candidate, it doesn't matter who originates the idea, has to go through a very transparent process where people have all unanimously got to agree. And there's only been, since this transfer committee has been set up, there's only been one transfer that was not unanimously agreed. So I think the structure works. Now, whether we bought value or we did not buy value, I think it's a subjective uh, discussion. And I'm very happy if somebody wants to bring a player that they think we didn't buy at the right price or for the wrong reasons. And the answer is, you know, we are going to make mistakes. We are going to overpay sometimes. Um, so you just said there, remember, though, you said you said um, that if you all don't agree. So that, that you said there was one time that you didn't agree. So does that, did that transfer not happen? So if you don't agree, that it just, you just don't sign the player? No, it was it went it went through. Uh, I was I was overruled, and it caused a boardroom uh, rift. Um, I lost, and the player came on board. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, so, just in response, Reese obviously who posted the initial question. He said um, Isaac Vassell uh, for a reported one million pounds uh, for someone who had been injured for most of his career, and uh, also Aidan Flint, a player who was very similar to Sean Morrison. Uh, and they can't play together as we've seen this season. And also, no resale value at uh, his age uh, would be his examples, I think. And uh, someone else just said Gary Medine obviously signed for a large amount of money. And then um, I'll just hijack this question for myself, actually. <laughs> obviously, Gary Medine signed for a, a good few million uh, reported and then left on a free. Um, could the club have perhaps got some sort of transfer fee for Gary Medine? It seems odd to have let him go on a free. Well, that's a lot of questions, right? Yeah, sorry about that. I hijacked that there. <laughs> just, and, uh... and my name is not Neil Warnock. I think these are <laughs> questions more for Neil than they are for me. Um, but I'm very, I'm very happy to have a go at them. That's, that's not a problem. Let's talk about Gary Medine first of all. Um, if you remember at the time, we were very, very close competing for promotion. 
and this was the January uh, transfer window, and Gary Medin um, was a favourite of, of the manager. He wanted him on board um, because he thought he could make that difference um, in giving us a chance of promotion. So the numbers, we can talk about the numbers, that's not a problem. You know, the, in my view, Gary Medin was valued around £3 million. We ended up paying five and a bit for him at the end of the day. And we took, we took, an, we took an educated decision that we're paying two, two and a quarter million more than we should have for a player which could just make that difference for promotion. Now, did he really make that difference for us or not? I don't know. But we did get promoted and he did play his part. The fact that he came off from there onwards is a whole dif different discussion. Cool. We, 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 we tried to sell him, but quite frankly, there were no takers. Um, even loading him out was 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 difficult, um, and I think Gary needed to move on um, and, and and we let him go. I mean that's you know we will not get everybody right, and I still think Gary Medine was the right decision for us in that promotion push in the last two and a half months. Do the club also consider um, obviously things like if the if the player is not happy in Cardiff, if he's homesick or He's is perhaps is he's mentally not uh, enjoying it, and he'd like a move. Or would the club really make the decision solely on what's best for Cardiff City? Look, if a player doesn't want to play for you, there's very little you can do. You know, you want people to play with passion and uh, and belief. And if they lose that, then you know that's down to the dressing room and the manager, really. Um, so when they don't want to play for you anymore, or their heart is not in it. You either got to cut your losses and move on, um, or, or or you try to turn them around. Um, and if you're successful in turning them around, great. Look at Kenneth Zohar, right? I mean, Kenneth did so all for us until Warnock came on board, right? And I still remember. I can't remember who we were playing now, but we went into a game. Um, I think it was Hull. We were two 0 down at half time. Went into the dressing room, came out, put Kenny Zohar on the on the field. He scored one and made one, and we drew that day. And I went to see Neil after the game. I said, "What on earth did you say to him?" And you know, he created a player that suddenly had belief and confidence in him. And then he gave us a very good season for us at that time. And the fact that he went off the boil again, and we were lucky, right? We sold it for eight million. You know, we pay seven hundred odd thousand. Actually, thanks to Ken Ken Chu, it was his uh, his PKI that picked them up in the first place. So you know, it's easy to look at the mistakes we make, and we will make mistakes. You know, you tell me a club that buys every player that works out. Yeah, of course, absolutely. Um, just following up to what we were just talking about, Reese did ask um, who was the player that you disagreed on uh, with the com with the rest of the committee. None of his business. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. Um also uh just kind of circling back a little bit with them um, the obviously the lockdown and COVID nineteen, did the club discuss with the players like individually whether they were you know comfortable with the things put in place, their maybe their you know their family situations and and things like that, or was it more of a group discussion? And I, I think I think both really, um, and and that's where Neil Neil Harris kind of comes on his own. You know that really was his prime role in in this period of time, and I think he did that. He kept the certainly the management informed. You know he had daily contact with um, with Ken. Um, he spoke to me whenever he felt he wanted to have a chat, or I did the same. Um, you know. I think as a club, I mean, one thing about Cardiff, you know, I, I would say almost from the moment Neil Warner came on board, it began to look like a club. And we were very united, we were very solid, you know, backroom, the staff, the players, the management team, we're, we're all on the same page, uh, about time, you would say, but we are actually on the same page. And yes, I mean, um, you know, I suffered a number of deaths in my family during in the last two months, and Cardiff City were brilliant. I'm, I'm, I'm other people that called me up, um, 
you know, I, I lost my uncle and I lost my mother. And number of Cardiff City uh, players and managers and staff that called me up was was very touching. So it's it's a club. It's a proper club. So is that is that the only piece what was missing then, Mehmet, in your opinion? Somebody like Neil to drive the club forward from the football level. Obviously, you 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 said earlier on that uh, that things in the back in, at the back of the club were, were were running nicely. You know what I mean? You've got nice teams together at the top, and you just thought a, a decent manager with a with a drive and a determination, like obviously Neil Warnock had. Was that the only thing what was missing? Yeah, I mean, if you said to me, you know, what's Neil's you know greatest achievement? I mean, I would say promotion was not it. I mean. I sort of expected him to get promoted. Um, but the way he went around building the fans and the management and everybody together, it's, it's worth gold, really. And, and we don't want to lose that ability. And, and Neil Harris is doing exactly the same thing. He's spending as much time as he can, making sure everybody has access to him. He's, he's talking to people all the time. Um, as I said, since I've been there, in the last three years, it's been the best time I've, I've been at Cardiff. Because the way people judge my role there is less they see me and less they hear of me, that means things are going well. Yeah. So I haven't been around for a while, so it's going well. Ah, there you go. Um, so just on that, if any players did decide that they weren't comfortable uh, for whatever reason, like a family reason or and it, someone in their family who's got immune issues or something like this, would they be kind of disciplined for not playing? Or not taking part in training? Oh, good God. Um, I better ask uh, Morrison to go and talk to them. Um, I have no idea. We haven't had one single player, you know, raising any issues. Certainly not that I know of. Um, okay. So, I, I, I don't see that. I, I really don't. I think we're all, all the same voice. Um, that's, how, that's about, um, how about how uh, about players who are out of contract, Mehmet? So obviously you've got a, you'll have a pool of players out of contract in the well, coming up to the end of this month. Um, how how's their contract going to be affected by the situation? Are they going to get their contract extended, or are they going to get obviously extra an extra month or two to finish the season, or how's that going to work? Well, we've determined to finish the season, so extending contracts to finish the season, yeah, sure. Um, some players will get their contracts renewed and some won't. So what happens? What I don't, I don't know if it has happened in Cardiff, but so what, what happens? Obviously, if a if a player has already signed a pre-contract agreement at another football club, how would how would that work? I don't know. We we don't have that situation. Right. Okay. It's an interesting one, that isn't it? We obviously we've mentioned that um, over the last few weeks, where by if a player's contract does run out on a certain day at the end of June, and then the season is still going into uh, July, it's mm. problematic. And if, if that player doesn't want to play for his team because he's signed a pre-contract, and he might not even legally be able to, I, I, I wouldn't know the ins and outs of it. But if you're out of contract, you can speak to clubs in January, can't you, I think? Yeah, but, so, but to be honest with you, it's irrelevant, right? If a player doesn't want to play for you, whether he's signed his contract or not, is, is not the issue. If he doesn't want to play for you, you don't want him on the team. You don't want him on that pitch. Mm. You know, you want players that's going to go through a brick wall for you. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. My only concern with it, with, with, with the whole situation, remember, is um, let's say a, a, a player signed for Leeds United, for example, uh, and he's by the first. Is he allowed to play from Leeds United from July the first? Well, if he's signed for Leeds United, I'll probably kill him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can't. We can't say that on here. We're not allowed. We, we've had too many people complain. Yeah, uh, but, and but, I, I agree, but I agree with you. Yeah, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so kind of moving away from uh, COVID-19 and uh, the lockdown, as it were, uh, obviously we had the, the, there was the tragic passing of Emiliano Sala after he was on the, the brink of or in the process of signing for Cardiff City. Um, there's been subsequent investigations, I would say, in inverted commas. Um, there's also been a, a book written by uh, author and journalist Harry Harris, who we had on the show uh, a few weeks back to discuss it. Um, uh, as I mentioned to you, offer I found it very, I find it very frustrating that so many uh, facts go unreported in the media. Um, 
and obviously the club has taken a massive amount of criticism, particularly from football fans, certain aspects of the media, because uh, the headline is always Cardiff City refused to pay the fee for Emiliano Sala. Is that difficult to, you know, di- difficult to experience when you you obviously know the facts and the truth, and you get criticised openly, regularly as a club? Oh, there's a lot there. Um, I mean, first of all, I don't think I know the facts and what happened and the truth. Mm-hmm. It, I really wish I did. Um, and, and that's one of the main problems with, with this particular situation. Um, look, the facts are very simple, right? A young man at the peak of his career has lost his life. And there needs to be a full and thorough investigation. And let me remind everybody, when this happened, I made a statement saying, we're an honorable club. If we have to pay, we will pay. But you need to understand first what happened. And I still don't know what happened. So why would I want to release that amount of money, which the future of the club could be well affected by it till we know the facts? So we have a cast hearing being set up, as you know, um, we haven't got a date as yet. Um, And we will put our case forward to CAS. The fact that FIFA ruling went against us, quite frankly, that was academic. It was always going to end up at CAS, no matter what the outcome would be. If we had a ruling in our favor, I guarantee you, Nons would have done the same. They would pick it up to CAS. So this thing still has to play out. And there are so many unknown facts still out there that we do need to be patient and hope that the regulators and the government and the and the law in particularly um, looks into all these things. On 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 that on the member, is there a, is there a time scale? Is have you been informed of any kind of how long it's going to take? Is it as long as a piece of string? Is you know what I mean? Cause obviously the family as well want justice. You know what I mean? There's obviously a. We're talking about two football clubs here who, who, who are talking about uh, a lot of money, but then you've got a family who are talking about uh, a son who's since lost his father. You know what I mean? So there's obviously, obviously there's a lot of tra- tragedy in their family. I tell you, my heart really goes to the family. Um, I haven't met them, um, um, but to lose a son, then losing a husband or a father in the case of um, Emilio's family is, is, is so tragic. And, and they are... I just feel they've been sort of neglected, really, by, by the law. I mean, the law needs to look into this. And they've got to do the right things. Um, and I, I just don't know how to describe it, my feelings on this. I just think nobody wants to actually deal with this situation. Mm. As you know, in France, uh, French law or French police have started criminal investigation into, into this case. So to answer your question, Andy, how long will this take? I don't know. Um, Cass is hearing probably around July, maybe August, because oh, okay. as nonce, nonce have asked for uh, extension for their filings because for some reason they, they didn't get the documentation done. We, of course, agreed because it's the right thing to do. And once they submit their papers, then we will ask for an extension because we, we need to study what they've written and what they've given in. So that's going to push the timeline out. There are two other outstanding issues out there. One is obviously the French criminal investigation, and the second one is the inquest. So how can CAS actually make a decision when those two investigations are still running? And also, yes. and also, and, well, uh, sorry, Sai. Um, yeah. Who's who's in charge of the investigation? Is it obviously obviously with the plane crashing in the middle of the middle of the ocean? You know what I mean? Allegedly, that who's is it? Is it is it the British or is it the French who's making well, this this case together? The, the, the French police have made it quite clear that they are undertaking criminal investigation into what happened. Right, okay. Okay, and, and, and that's a fact. The law in England really has left everything to the inquest that is taking place at the moment, and that's at least one year away from now. There is no criminal investigation in the United Kingdom. It is only in France. Okay. So- Interesting. It is really interesting. Is um, is the club uh, doing anything to help support the family uh, as like an ongoing thing, or was it? Is it really? Uh, what do I say? Like, 
obviously they would there would have been contact and support at the time of uh, his passing but are the club doing anything to help the family going forward in terms of whether it's get just you know get justice for emiliano well there, we can't get justice for emiliano because there is no price uh, attached to that um as you know you know we have announced the fact that we have as cardiff city we have set up an emilio sala trust and um, we have committed to put i think up to two million pounds into that trust and we will spend considerable amount of money in setting that trust up we did invite others to contribute but i didn't get a call from nonce at all or from anybody else as a matter of fact so yeah i think i think you know we stood up where it was necessary um, I wanted to ask you a question, and actually someone else has just asked a similar question. Uh, so the question in the chat was, would the club ever work with Willie Mackay or his son on a transfer? Um, I'm, I'm assuming not, but I'll let you answer it. There are lots of Willie Mackays. <laughs> <laughs> the, one that's banned, the one that's Wonderful banned in answer. France, but still working on transfers in January in france i guess yeah. is that what do you think of course well not. can i ask you about that actually um obviously william mckay is banned from working on football transfers in france yet this past january 2020 he was working on bringing players from france to the uk now if i know that i'm assuming that it wouldn't be too difficult for the powers that be who would uh, police that sort of thing sure, surely they should know as well look it's, that's a very, there's a very simple answer to your question but actually it's a much bigger question than I think you realise William Mackay is doing nothing that he shouldn't be doing right? William Mackay is a person who made his living in being an agent of football players whether he's been banned or he's not been banned he's doing the best that he knows to make a living the fact that the regulatory environment allows him to do that is what we need to focus on. You know, if, if you can be banned and you can continue to work, imagine your stockbroker who's been banned for insider trading and you're still buying stocks from that stockbroker. It, you know, it's not William Mackay's fault. He's, he's, he's making a living. He's doing what he knows best, whether it's right or wrong. It's, 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 it's not the issue here. Why is, are the regulators, why is FIFA... Why is the FA allowing him to get away with it? When he goes on BBC TV and says, I did, the, I did that transfer, I was hiding behind my son's license, but I did the transfer. And everybody says, it's okay. <laughs> That's my point. Where are the regulators? It's not about Willie Mackay. Willie's just doing the best that he can at, to make a living. That's, that's his priority. That's his exploiting the system. So how could we stop that then, Mehmet? How can you stop that? Because obviously, apparently he set up a uh, a limited company which uh, he works. His son's work for him. His his, his wife's his name wife on the, name his, his wife's named on the company as well. So you know, what I mean, if he if he's not named on anything, he's not doing anything wrong. He's just giving advice to people. You know what I mean? But he's still he's still playing a big part in it. How can we stop that? Because obviously, we don't want football well, clubs to be caught out by. The same I think thing. there are two two answers to that, right? First of all, he's gone on TV and he's said what he's doing publicly I, it's on bbc you know you can replay why has fifa not taken action against the clubs that mm. use him that was my, that, that's what I, that's what i thought i thought that that, that, that that was the answer i was looking for that that clubs if clubs get punished then the clubs won't use the individuals again because why would a club want to get punished for something that they've got no they've got no power to be and you know what i mean they, 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 they can use any agent they could use direct contact with the club if they wanted to or they could, you could use another agent from another from another country or whatever to do to broker a deal it just doesn't make sense to me why they've got to he seems as though he's got a lot of power in France to bring people over he's got a good reputation to bring people over from France to England because he's done that quite a lot over his uh, over his career but that's what he knows best right it's, it's his job it's, it's what he's good at so I don't want to focus on him I want to focus on the regulatory environment that allows this to happen and continues to allow it to happen. If the if football clubs like Cardiff and, and other clubs in the UK, for instance, were to write a letter from, you know, as a group, for instance, complaining of such things, whether it's Willie Mackay 
or are there another agent who would or was also banned and still working would would that force fifa to act if there was an a complaint from a club pointing if, out the problem if i wrote a letter in chinese and i sent it to fifa and their fate would have the same effect <laughs> they're just not they're just not interested and that's what's wrong with the game right yeah don't but, you yeah think I... Don't you think? Don't you think I I would not have tried all those things? I would imagine so. Yeah, I think that's the, that you are really, you are right. That is the problem is the uh, the people who are running football, uh, whether it's FIFA, whether it's the FA, the Championship people, it's the Premier League. There's there's uh, there's not enough leadership from any of them to improve things in so many different aspects whether it's financially with things like salary caps whether it's dodgy agents or other such things um sam vaughan in the chat asks uh what would you say to willie mckay sorry what would you say to willie mckay when he said you abandoned salah what? well it depends whether i can understand what he says to me in scottish but um <laughs> 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 He says that I abandoned Salah. Yes. I don't know how you could say that we abandoned Salah. No. On what grounds? I mean, you know, we paid top dollar in the history of this club for this player. Um, we give him, we gave him all the assistance that was necessary. Um, now I could retaliate and make accusations about. How could you put a player of that value and a human life into an airplane like the one they did in? But I'm not going to do that. So I don't believe I abandoned anybody. Every player that we have ever hired or signed, we gave him the same professional uh, service that we always have done. So I'm guessing I know the answer to this, uh, Mehmet. That obviously, so you've just said there about 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 the airplane. I know, I know it's not tip for tat, and we're not going to go into an argument uh, about that. But uh, was there a different um, form of um, getting him from Nantes to back to back to Cardiff was there a different form of transport than the one he took, already put in place by the club. Of course, sir. I mean the answer is of course. I mean the British Airways club class ticket is is is, is not a bad way to travel. Um, you know, I mean I normally do EasyJet, but you know, <laughs> we you just paid you just paid top dollar for a player though, so you push the boat out. You know, but you know we 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 offer them uh, like we do all our players. Uh, and if the player wanted a private plane, he should come to us. Um, and, and they don't. Now, the obvious question is, you know, should we have checked the plane? Should we have satisfied ourselves it was safe? As you know, we've been lobbying since that experience, all the way from House of Lords to the House of Commons, in fact, that they should be standard safety checks on any transportation of any sportsman. Um, this was a tragedy that I think should also be highlighting the, the mode of transport that takes place. I mean, the planes like the one that went down is not unusual, especially in the horse racing industry, is used quite frequently. Yeah. So there needs to be some sort of legislation around that particular aspect of air transport. Yeah. You, you know, from Nantes, he could have driven to from Nantes, um, he could have taken a train, but British Airways was as good as any. Yeah. But also, there's facts as well about the about the aircraft that he did take. That there's also been so many um, crashes using that aircraft, with obviously with with certain weather as well. So obviously that I'm not saying it did have an impact on on what happened that fateful night, but obviously you know what I mean. There's this history on that kind of aircraft as well. Well, look, I mean, there's got a whole chapter of uh, coincidences, right? I mean, first of all, you you pick an airplane, which and you read the report in January or February that came out. Um, Clearly, the airplane wasn't fit to be in the air. You know, it, it's, it, it's quite clear. Then you hire a pilot who doesn't have the right licenses to take passengers and happens to be colorblind um, at the same time. So, you know, you talk about I abandoning a player. I talk about how do you actually take responsibility to put somebody into a vehicle of that nature? Um, but as I said, we're not going to go down that route because that's not what this is about. Mm. But nevertheless, you know, we paid a very large fee for us. And we believed that 
we were going to receive a player who would play for Cardiff City Football Club. That on that point, on, on, that, on that point, then, Mehmet, if if obviously what happened didn't happen and and the transfer went through and 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 Emiliano was was on the pitch like we all would have hoped he would have been, um, do you believe the season would have had a different outcome? And do you think that what happened had a I didn't, obviously a negative outcome on the rest of the season with the players? There's so many ways I can answer that question. And the answer is yes, undoubtedly. I mean, Salah was a proven striker. He could have made a difference because we only got relegated by the thinnest margin. Yeah. And secondly, to be honest with you, the Chelsea game is what cost us. And I totally agree. Game, totally agree. I mean, yeah. I mean, three mistakes by the referee at the Chelsea game. And, you know... He, he clearly forgot to go to Specsavers that day. Um, two of them were clear offside. You could have been arguing about two penalty shouts, one definitely. Um, so, you know, it, it just wasn't going to be our season. Um, and yeah. the last thing I would say about that, certain people in the club were never the same after that tragedy. Yeah. Um, I mean... You could see that just by Neil Warnock's demeanor, how much it affected him personally. You could see, like for months afterwards, how much it had affected him. Um, did the club support him? You know, obviously, in uh, the fact that he was clearly affected by it, he was uh, very upset by it, obviously. Well, depends what you mean by support. You know, did he have counseling? Did we go to a psychiatrist or a therapist? The answer is no. You know, did I sit down with a bottle of whiskey and a couple of cigars and talk things through? Absolutely. Um, I mean, that's what we do, right? Um, yeah. we, we, we support each other at a time like this. Um, and Neil's very supportive of everybody around him. It was time that we were supportive of him. But, you know, he's, he's a tough old boy, so he knows what he's doing. But it did affect Neil, there was no question. Obviously, later on in, uh, obviously, the following season, this season, obviously, he ended up uh, leaving the club. Do you think, obviously, what happened six months previous, do you think that ever had, a, had an impact on him leaving this, leaving his post? I, I mean, I don't know, uh, Andy, to be really honest. I, I would imagine it played a key part. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it was the only thing. Uh, no, no, no. No, we, 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 we spoke. We spoke at length about, you know, that the certain things just, you know what I mean? If it was, I, I don't know, it, it, especially this season, we've looked at Cardiff quite uh, in depth, and you know what I mean about Neil Warnock's sides, or notoriously, especially from Cardiff when he first took over, um, that they were tough to beat, hard to beat, defensively strong, and and this season there's been certain things, especially defensively, that we've that we've highlighted a little bit, you know what I mean, and and, and we've we, we don't know obviously what's going on in house, and, and and if that 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 kind of incident affected Neil's mindset or confidence or um, process within football, so. I mean, the only thing I can tell you is I try very hard to convince Neil to wait till the end of the season before yeah. he went. So at the end, it was his decision. He wants to go. Did um, did Neil Warnock ever come close to leaving uh, after we got relegated? No. Okay. Um, sorry, Andrew. I was just going to... We had a few questions uh sent in from people just about the Emiliano Sala thing. So I just wanted to kind of finish up on that subject with those. Uh, so the first question that was sent in was, um, uh, have you read the book by Harry Harris? And if so, what was your opinion of it? Harry will kill me if I really speak my mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, watching, he's watching as well, Mehmet. No, I, I'm sure Harry is, and he's having a little giggle at the moment. Look, I think it's um, it's a factually good book in, in in the sense that there isn't a great deal of narrative. In fact, there uh, it's it's very much documents, and he and I like that because you know he's not messing around with the documentation and the source itself. So I think it's a very good reference book to certain key events that took place and are well documented. So from that point of view, I think he's done a good job in collating together the facts and a timeline which causes tragedy. So from that point of view, I think it's a good book. Um, do I think the analysis of what happened, or do we get a sense of who 
was who it probably needs a lot more work to be to be able to get there and that's not a criticism of harry i think that's just a statement the fact that the facts are not still out there that that still needs to come forward um there's nothing in the book that one can disagree with because it's so factually written the conspiracy theory in the book of course is is one that plays on people's imagination and at the moment you know we're not into that uh realm of the world, you know, we want to stick with the facts that that faces us. So I like the book from a factual point of view. I think it's a book that needs to be updated. And I think it will probably get another revised uh, edition in the next six months to a year, because there's a lot more to go. Wait till I write my book. No, I look forward to that yeah, one. Yeah, it's good um, to going back to the book, though, just one a question from me. Uh, obviously, we had a, 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 a quite a big debate on here. And uh, we spoke to Harry about about the title of the book. Um, when you saw the title of the book, what were your initial thoughts before you read it? Because I was like, when I, when I read the book, when I read the book, I, I was the title didn't really match the what was inside the book for me. No, I didn't like the title, and uh, Harry chose my views on that. Yeah, same as me. Yeah, and I think that's probably uh, when you see people on social media when we've talked about it. Uh, or when we've done shows about the book, is that's the first criticism which people get because they instantly think that the title is in some way trying to sensationalise or, or capitalise on the the death of Emiliano Sala. But like you say, it's quite a factual book. Um, okay, uh, sorry, just last couple of questions on this because people have taken the time to send them in. Uh, Sam says... Um, if the transfer fee is paid to Nantes uh, eventually when all the investigations and th uh, things are over, will uh, Willie Mackay and his son take a large cut as agents in the deal? This seems distasteful at best, shocking, disgusting at worst. I agree with the conclusions. Um, there is no evidence anywhere or any reference to the fact that he will not take his commission. Now that that um, is infuriating, and I find it absolutely so shocking. I just to the point where not much surprises me, but the fact that yeah, but but you know, hold on a second. I, I don't want to just point the finger at at him. There are other agents involved who have also not said that they will not take any money from this. Okay, but it's not just him. I don't want to single him out that, that that would be unfair although he has got the biggest chunk but mm -hmm. no other agent has said i won't take any money of course but he is also uh the person who kind of Look, well, certainly seems that he was the most heavily involved in the so transfer the link, yeah the the, 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 the travel arrangements everything look let me tell you um a bit of an inside story when when all this happened I try to find a way to navigate through this. And, and here was my approach. Tragedy has taken place. A young man lost his life. Two clubs have suffered, regardless of who did what. 15 million euros is at play. So I said, look, why don't we just split in the middle? You know, you take some of the pain, we'll take some of the pain. All the agents drop their fees. So if you take all the agents fee out, you're down to probably around 11 and a bit million pounds, right? So if you then take, take, take two million each out of that and put it into a trust, which then can look after the family, then the both sides, you know, suffer to the tune of around four, four and a half million each. But Unbelievable. It, it didn't fly. Oh, wow. Was that, was that a non -stop? Was that, was that just, Buffered down? Was it? Did nobody? Nobody wants. Nobody was interested. Nobody's interested at all. Yes, because so, obviously, we, obviously, we, we, then we, we go back to the we go back to the original uh, conversation we had about, probably about twenty minutes ago about the family. That there's a family here stuck in the middle, wants justice, um, and Cardiff City seem like they're the only football club and the only people involved who are trying to do something right um, for the ethically right for the family. Yeah, look. We, as, I mean, we talked about this, and my heart goes out to them. But what you have to realize, um, Andy, we can't afford this sort of money. No, no, totally. You know, I mean, Vincent has deep pockets, but, you know, there's a limit to how much we can go and knock on his door and say, please give us more money. 
So what, what financial implications could this have for the football club then? I mean, personally, unless Vincent steps up, we're, we're bust. Right, OK. Wow. That's, that's, uh, yeah. that's scary stuff, though, Sai, isn't it? You know what I mean? We, yeah. You know what I mean? That, 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 that thing, you know what I mean? The figures you were talking about earlier on, about uh, each month, £3 million, you know what I mean? And I, that, that, that I know I know the, what the figures are, are leaving middles of a football club on a, on a monthly basis. And it's, it's, it's scary that football clubs are, you know what I mean, are having to go through these kind of times at the minute. And then there's that on top of it, which potentially could ruin a, a football club with a huge fan base and... And all for a, you know what I mean? When, especially when there's 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 a there's a bigger picture involved as well with the family and stuff. You know that it's just it doesn't sit right with it doesn't sit right with football fans. I don't. I don't it certainly doesn't sit right with yourself. Obviously, you can tell with the, uh, obviously with the comments and the way that you talk. And you know what I mean? The only there's, and, there's, and, and even if you had to pay pay the money, remember that there's no winner. Yeah, the, the nuns can't see this as, as a victory because the, 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 there's, there's 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 no one. No one's going to win out of this whole situation. No. No, no, it's, um, it's, there's a lot more to come yet. Yeah, totally. That's totally. scary in itself that there's mm. so much uh, so much more to come. Um, Sam also added, uh, have Cardiff changed the way uh, they would transfer players since this tragedy? So if they sign someone from another country, uh, have, they, you know, have you changed anything regarding travel arrangements for players? Well, yes. Uh, the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we will not allow our players to go in any private planes that has not been certified and checked beforehand. Um, I mean, that's the least that one can do from, from this experience. And secondly, you know, we want to take responsibility um, to the transfer of any player that we are planning to uh, sign. And uh, so, yeah, it's, um, it's, uh such a sad situation and what i find uh makes it worse is that it's it seems like it's going to drag on for a very long time before the real answers are given and there's a real kind of um ending to the to the to the arguing particularly between the two football clubs because you know it's not uh, a great kind of Look, when you see Nantes uh, being quite vocal in their criticism of Cardiff City, um, although I have to say I don't remember uh, reading or hearing any comments coming from Cardiff the other way in terms of real uh, public criticism. I'm sure, or I'd imagine that there's been some criticism behind closed doors, but Cardiff generally, I, I don't know about you, and can you think of anything where? Like where Nantes have been quite public about their criticism of Cardiff City, uh, I don't uh, remember I, it the other way. I just, I, well, first and foremost, and we spoke about this. We spoke to Harry, and we we spoke about before when we did the show about the book that, um, you know what I mean. Put my Cardiff City hat off, remember that, you know what I mean. Ex player, supporter of the club, you know what I mean. That I feel really sorry the amount of stick that the club that the club's got. You know what I mean. That's not just from, um, from Nantes giving Cardiff stick. It's a whole of football, really, because I think. You know what I mean? I think they forget about the bigger picture sometimes that an individual has, has lost, well, two individuals have lost a life. You know what I mean? But there's a young footballer who was in the form of his life. He was just got his dream moved to the Premier League. Um, and, you know what I mean? It's not about money. It's not about this. It's not about that. It's not about the agent. It's not about uh, writing a book. It's about, you know what I mean? There's, there's somebody who's lost a life. There's family who's been absolutely destroyed. And, you know what I mean? And all, all for now for tit for tat and causing, you know what I mean? And this, this is dragging on for how long? We said earlier that how long is a piece of string? Who's going to make a decision? You know what I mean? It was great that, say, hopefully uh, June, June, July time or whatever. You know what I mean? I just I just hope that the, the family can get closure and, you know what I mean? Because, it, you know, football's a business and the negative effect it had on Cardiff City because... Um, I, don't, I, I didn't see them getting relegated with that with that extra little bit. It was the only thing I think Cardiff, was, Cardiff City were missing that season was... Uh, was the firepower up front? It was creating chances against a good side, yeah. and, it, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, what I mean, yes, the Chelsea game had a, a huge impact, and all we've done, Mehmet, on this show is slag VAR off. But if VAR was there that day, Cardiff yeah. City would be still be in the Premier League. So, you know, what I mean, I, I, yeah, you know, what or, I mean? I'm not going to change my tune on it. Or the referee went to spec savers. We would have been, yeah, <laughs> or both. But yeah, it's just, you know, what I mean, it's such a. It's such a cutthroat industry, but it's it's fine margins, and you know what I mean. There's just there's, there's two fine margins we're talking about here. 
The only thing I can tell you is no matter what the outcome is at CAS, this is not over. No. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of comments in the, the live chat and also uh, Robert, Hunt, Robert Hutchinson uh, sent me a message earlier asking if the club has any plans to honour Peter Whittingham uh, further, maybe even was higher than number seven jersey. Um, could you give us any information on any plans for that? No, um, I just think it's too, too recent, too raw. Okay. Um, Whittingham has enormous respect at Cardiff, um, from Vincent Tan down to everybody. Of course, we will do something to honour him. We just think it's a little bit too soon. Okay. Um, just having a quick look through the li live chat. There's so many comments that I'm struggling between Facebook, YouTube, and uh, Twitter. Uh, Andrew Woodfield asks, would uh, Emiliano Sala have been insured and by which club at the time of the tragedy? You know, I don't normally like saying I'm not going to answer a question. Okay. This one really, I just can't. It's, yeah, okay. it's, a, it's a legal thing. So forgive me whoever is asking that question. In fairness, you've been very honest to every single yeah. question, so I Amazing. think we'll uh, there. Amazingly, we'll, uh, we'll we'll give you that one. Um, Richard Grant asked. Uh, he says he wasn't a great fan of the rebrand. Uh, in all fairness, though, he, Vincent Tan has kept the club afloat. Uh, he could have walked away and sent us. Uh, obviously, he would have gone bust. Um, will we be seeing more of him at games coming up, or has he taken more of a back seat now? And uh, also. Uh, is there future plans to invest to try and get us back to the Premier League? Now, I mean, the rebrand thing, I think it was just before my time, right? But I think I caught the tail end of it or uh, the beginning of it and, and change. Now, I, let me just make a couple of points here. First of all, the rebrand was actually not a failure. Everybody okay. bought into the rebrand, including the various fan groups that, that were part of the uh, discussion. It's when Mackay was dismissed that it all went belly up. The whole brand issue became a big, big issue in the club. So first of all, you know, we should just look at it in the perspective of what took place. Now, I think we learned from that experience, or I think Vincent has definitely learned from that experience, because I still to this day remember that night when we had a meeting with the fans and everybody to change from red back to blue and i got to be honest with you i chaired many meetings in my life that was one of the most nervous evenings that i've ever had the experience because it had to be pitch perfect so that vincent didn't change his mind and that he would support it all and it really did go really well the fans and the fan groups were very supportive it, it, it went really well Look, that was a mistake, I think, and, and I think we would all accept that now. And, and Vincent did the right thing, you know, when he saw the, the strength and the, and, and, and the unhappiness of the, of the uh, fan base. You know, he, he, you know, it takes a big guy to make decisions like that, to, to change a decision, and he did that. And, and I think people should not keep going back to that and holding, holding him accountable for that. He made a mistake, he has corrected it. He has put enormous amount of money into this club and continues to do so. And it's not the fact that he didn't walk away and go and bust. I can tell you that because I did it. I had an offer for the club and I put it in front of Vincent saying, if you want out, here's an offer, take the money and let's get out of here. And he said, no. He said, I have an obligation to leave this club in a better state than when I took over. And he said, till I get to that stage, he said, I'm not going anywhere. And that was two years ago. So, you know, I'm not here to um, suck up to Vincent, but I think he does deserve some credit for continuous putting his hand in his pocket. Yeah, it's, it's, um, there's no doubt that he has invested an incredible amount of money in the football club. And as we discussed earlier, uh, has stable, stabilised the football club compared to where it was uh, a few years back. Um, but just for your information, you know, the amount of money he's actually burned is 200 million. Not invested, it's burnt, right? Oof, that's a lot of a lot of money. Um, wow. Uh, so James Costley, uh, he asked this question earlier, and he's asked it again. So I'm going to put it to you. Uh, he says, "Why was Bobby Reed sold to a promotion rival uh, in Fulham?" 
because they gave us a very good offer. Uh, look, again, it's a question really to Neil Warnock rather than me. You know, I think at the end of the day, in the final analysis, I think the football that Neil Warnock was playing didn't suit Reed. And Reed didn't feel terribly comfortable the style of football that was being played. So we tried to adjust to that and we were not getting there. And when Fulham came with the offer that they did, we took it. And I think it was the right thing for us to do because you can't force a player to play in a certain style. That, and we were not going to change the team. Now, you may ask, you may ask the question, but well, why did you buy me in the first place? But that's really a question for the football manager rather than me. So going on, on the style of football, I remember, does the, does the style of football impress Mehmet Dalman in the board? Ah, uh, that's a that's a tricky question, right? I mean, um, everyone everybody wants your team to play nice, attractive, attractive, attacking football. But end of the day, we're all in a, we're all in the results business, and we all know that. Um, obviously, when when Neil Warnock got us got us promoted, um, we based ourselves on a on a strong baseline defence that we got a lot of clean sheets, a, a record in the league at the, at the at the time, which worked and. And obviously the club progressed on further there, but you know what I mean. Obviously, obviously Neil Warnock's gone. Obviously Neil Harris has taken over. Can you then see um, similarities or differences in in both managers' style of play? Um, obviously, I like to see much more pure football than we see at the moment or we we saw in the past. Um, but that doesn't come overnight. You, you no, you're no. not going to change the whole team overnight. Yeah. Um, too early for me personally to compare Neil Harris to Neil Warnock because I haven't had enough time to work with Neil Harris. I haven't seen what his plans are as yet. You know, he's taken over the team in the middle of a season. You know, he's got his hands full and he's got my full support and just make sure that, um, you know, he gets us to where we want to get to. And if not, you know what, we'll go again. It's, 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 it's not a problem. Um, I enjoyed the period of Neil Warnock when we were there because every yeah. game was, you knew you were in a game, you know, you, you, you went home saying, well, even when we lost, you went, well, we had a go, right? Yeah. Um, so he brought us the excitement because the previous two managers before Neil, you know, it just wasn't happening, you know, with, with due respect to Russell Slade and um, Trollope, um, it, it wasn't happening. So yeah. it was good to have Neil getting us promoted and feeling winners again. It's a great shame that, you know, we didn't kick on from there. Um, but then again, you know, in the Premier League, you've got to spend the sort of money that is demanded of you. And we didn't do that. Has um, Neil been given a target to achieve this season? We've obviously taken over during the season. Look, I mean... It's, it's a question that, you know, it doesn't have an answer, really, because obviously your task is to get us promoted. But yeah. that's that's just a flippant remark, right, at the end of the day. And I'm sure Neil Harris will want to get us um, promoted as much as anybody else. And I'm sure he will do the best that he can. Hmm. Whenever he can, you know, jury's out. I think it's a big ask, personally. I think it really is a big ask. Um but, you know, we will support him through that period. I mean, he has his own views. He has his own style. Um, and I think we have to give him, a, give him time to adjust. He yeah. deserves okay. that. Okay. So then moving back, uh, moving back to you. So what, what attracted you to Cardiff City? Why Cardiff? Why are all, the, all the teams in the world, potentially? So why Cardiff City? Like all good things in life, it was an accident. <laughs> so... Um, no, I mean, the true story, actually, is I was in Kuala Lumpur um, on a totally different subject, um, something to do with some bond issue or another. And a very good friend, a mutual friend of Vincent Tan and myself suggested that we have lunch. So I had lunch with him. And Vincent being Vincent, you know, he sort of Googled me. And so, so at lunch, he, said, he turned around and said to me, I see you know a little bit about football. I said, I know zero about football. Um, but he says, you did all these things in football clubs. And I said, yes, that's, that's also true, but that's all financial, not 
football. And then he said, well, would you go on the board for me? Um, and I said, yeah, sure. I like football. Why not? Right. Uh, it's, as you know, it's a non remuneration role. Um, so getting free tickets and going to see the football from the inside was attractive. Right. So I said, of course I would. So when I came into England, um, I, I went to meet the board and I phoned Vincent and said, I have news for you. You don't have a board. Um, so, <laughs> so that's how it sort of started really. And, and when we got promoted to the premier league first time round, I rang up and said, look, I guess you should step up and be the chairman. And Vincent said, no, no, I think you should be the chairman. Um, because I can't spend the sort of time that I think is, is going to require. And, and, and I said, yes, I'll, I'll, I would do that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a great ride. I mean, yeah. ups and downs for sure, but do I have any regrets doing it? Absolutely not. Do I love it? There are times where I hate it and there are times where I actually love it. So then, uh, on that, on that ride then, so what's the high and the low for Cardiff? So what's the highest high and what's the lowest low? Well, getting, getting relegated twice in my tenureship is two low points, right? Um, yeah. You know, they, they, they were both very painful, um, especially the last one, because yeah. I really didn't think we deserved to get relegated. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the higher courses getting promoted the second time was more important for me because I really wasn't part of the first time. You know, I was just sort of coming in at that time. I wasn't chair. I was, so I didn't get the same buzz, if, if that's the right word. And um, obviously, the second time we got promoted, it, it, it was a wonderful feeling. Yeah, well, the second one was amazing. I, I, I was at the game and the, and the atmosphere during, before, you know what I mean? The, the whole, the whole what was going on with Fulham and the whole, you know what I mean? The whole just yeah. day was just you know, sensational. Surreal. You know, people used to say to me, there's no better feeling than when you have a horse that wins a major race. And I tell you, I had horses that won major races, but the feeling at the car that getting promoted was not comparable. Yeah. Wow. Um, so a couple of comments in the live chat. Uh, Gaz Cubbins says, can Mehmet get Neil Warnock on the show so we can ask him? I think he was <laughs> referring to some of the earlier questions. Uh, Dave McNally asks, how long has Eddie Hearn been involved with Cardiff? Who's he? There you go. Um, Eddie Hearn is a boxing promoter. Boxing promoter. Never heard of him. There you go. He's ex excellent in Orange Chairman. He is. He used to be anyway a few years ago. Uh, Blue Blood says, uh, is a director of football on the cards for Cardiff City? Well, I thought that was my job. There you go. No, no. Hey. I mean, look, no. it, it's Vincent's call. Um, and at the moment, we have absolutely no plan to do that. Is that the way that football is going, though, Mehmet, do you think? Obviously, the... The top Euro European clubs do it, you know what I mean? You, you talk about a, a transfer policy and, and, a, and, a, and a group who picks transfers. That, that obviously is, is someone's job as well, you know what I mean? Direct the football who brings the players in and, 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 and hands them to the manager to, to yeah. pick the side, so to speak. You know what? Um, I was reading a, a, a recent book called The Human Factor, which looks at uh, foreign policy of US, Britain and Russia, effectively Reagan, Thatcher and uh, Gorbachev. And the thesis of the book is that there's a human element to this. In fact, it's called a human factor. I think if you get a director of sport that has good rapport and the respect of a football manager, I think it works. And I think it works for the benefit of the club rather than the manager. But I think if you get that human factor wrong, where the director of sport and the manager are at loggerheads, it's a disaster. Mm. And we haven't come across anybody yet. It's not as if we haven't looked. We have looked. Um, we haven't found anybody yet we felt would be able to get on with the managers that we had so far. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine a director of football telling Warnock what to do? <laughs> no. Yeah. Was it ever considered for Neil, <laughs> Neil Warnock to move upstairs uh, when he decided he had had enough? Yes, of course. But he wasn't interested. Was it he wasn't interested in that or just didn't come about? Um, I think... It's one of those things you you know you need to move on and and reflect on what had taken place um i mean don't get neil leaves with our blessing right i mean 
with, with our gratitude and and i like to think and i have great fond memories of him you know i i, I love working with the man um he wasn't without his challenges but um <laughs> you know he he brought joy to card the football again whether you like his style of football or not is a different matter but um i enjoyed I enjoyed uh, working with him. He was the easiest manager, all the managers I worked with, to work with. Um, so, there you go. so, director of football, Andy Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, you need to make up your mind. You want to be a striker or you want to be a director? <laughs> <laughs> uh, play, play manager. Play manager. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I just trying to flick through as many of these questions in the live chat as i can as we kind of come towards the end of the show uh Lee lewis asks uh, how much time goes into scouting potential player transfers and is the initial targets outlined by the manager or the board um very good question actually and and that gives me a cue to talk about ken chu a little bit um ken chu's done a great job in the club um he really has bought uh, He's brought a lot of transparency in the way things are done. So he actually reversed the policy in the scouting area. He's the one who really spent a lot of time and money in building um, building the, um, the scouting side. So there's now quite a strong scouting culture, um, quite a lot of analysis that goes on. And, and that's a very good thing. Um, you know, we don't, we don't buy players on the back of what the manager wants anymore. Um, there are checks and balances going through that. As I said to you at the beginning, with the, my view is any of the key people in the club can put forward a player, but it all starts from the manager. Manager has to start by telling us what he needs, what he needs to change. So let's assume he wants a right back. You know, he can go out and propose right backs. We can go out and find uh, right backs through the network of people that we have. And we now actually have a decent network of people that we can actually source names and players, which goes into our scouting team that do the work that they need to do. Um, at the end of the day, the manager has a veto right. We will not force a player onto a manager. On the other hand, and Neil Harris is great to work with on this side. You know, he's very open. Um, he's, he's very proactive in all this. Um, and again, you know, just coming back to my original point, Ken ties all those things up really well. And he's very transparent, very good at communication. You know, he talks to us all the time. I wish he didn't talk as much as he does, but he does talk to us all the time. I talk to him about four or five times a day. Wow. So on that transfer policy then, Mehmet, so what is, uh, obviously, I know, obviously things have changed with, with COVID-19 uh, and things, but will Neil Harris be given a... Um, a transfer budget to increase the, the quality of his squad for next season? I don't know. I really don't. Um, it'll depend on a number of factors. One, how big is the, is the hole? And we will have a massive deficit. Um, you can do the maths, you know, three months of no income. Yeah, no, um, I totally agree. So you're, you're looking at 10 million deficit just mm. on those three months alone. Yeah. Is Vincent Tam prepared to put his hand in his pocket for more players? Now, don't forget, Vincent's business is retail and leisure and hotels. And guess what sector has suffered the most during this yeah. Uh, crisis? Yeah, leisure. So I think we're going to be a little bit short of cash. Um, so I would hate to mislead anybody in saying, yes, of course, we're going out there and get the right players. I think we're going to finish the season and then sit down and take stock of how bad the damage is. There will yeah. be a damage. You know, this, you know, yeah, no, that. no, no. Really appreciate your honesty. It's, 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 it's it, I think it's just the way of the world, and I think, I think that's why obviously teams have been pushing for the for the for the season to finish the Leeds, the Leeds United, for example, because the, the holy grail is that Premier League, and the Premier League money is so important. Um, obviously to put to push the club forward, and and then it obviously goes on to the next point as well. Though. So how how important is the is the parachute money then for for teams who come out of the Premier League? It's it's a very important. It's it's actually it's actually critical, right? To make the adjustment, um, yeah. As you know, we're running out of our um, parachute payments, so we we gonna yeah. have, you know, manage this about all by ourselves. Yeah. So when you say critical and important, is that is that because you're obviously paying Premier League wages, you drop down the Championship, you don't make wholesale changes because you're trying to get 
back into the, the Premier League with a similar squad or the same squad uh, that you had. And then obviously you bring players in as well, which obviously increases uh, the wage budget as well. Well, how many teams bounce right back? Not that well, I, well, there's probably only West Brom in the last probably five years who've, who've, who've yo yoed up and down when they've yeah. done it. But now they're stuck in the Championship again for a couple of seasons. So it's, it's, not, it's not easy. And, and people forget that we get Premier, Premier League parachute payments over four years. The first first payment is quite chunky. Second yeah. is less than the first, and the third and the fourth actually are quite small. Yeah. So it's not as if you know you've got eighty million divided by four. It isn't. Yeah. And we're obviously at the tail end of that, so we can't really rely too much on the parachute payments to get us through this crisis. Yeah. yeah. It helps. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. Yeah, of course. Saying... Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 I just, I just obviously, you know, I mean, people. Uh, talk about the parachute payments like it's uh, going to save a football club and they can carry on spending the way that they did in the Premier League for the next three, four seasons to try and get promoted. You know what I mean? So it's just obviously an insight in, into what really goes on because the, the numbers and the figures in the Premier League are, are just outrageous. And You know what I mean? I think you obviously see a lot of clubs who try to cut the cloth accordingly in the Championship um, and either sell players to try and make the, make that deficit up or, or, or just... Or just the clubs just seem to change drastically sometimes, really. But when you look at the wages bill in the championship, you know, you've got clubs paying six million at the bottom end, and then you've got 45, 50 million at the top end of the championship. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot of money for a championship to have 50 million. Mm. I mean, if Wolves take Wolves, right? I mean, they built the Premier League quality team. Yeah. So when they got promoted, they didn't have to spend that. But they spent over, what, 130 million? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. I, I, I don't want to mislead anybody, but it would be around that number. Yeah, yeah, definitely over 100 with the Neves and uh, Joe Moutinho's and all the players that they brought in. They brought in a hell of a lot of players. Yeah. Uh, Mehmet, just a final question from me, uh, really. I just would like to know, um, due to the way Craig Bellamy left Cardiff City, uh, is the door closed on him ever becoming, uh, or at least in the foreseeable future, becoming a manager or a coach or coming back to the club in that sort of capacity? Well, you know something I don't. Why would the door be closed to Craig? Well, I think, obviously, going by the media reports, there was some sort of complaint made about him. Do you, uh, I think it was the coach of the academy, uh, and was it, just like, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and a parent, I think, complained. And then suddenly, uh, after being... I think not working for a while. He then went to uh, the Belgian side, which I can't remember the name of. Uh, he's gone to Anderlecht. Anderlecht yeah. Just um, another. Say again, sorry. A small club in Belgium. Yeah, I, I just yeah. couldn't remember the name. Just, just not as big. Just not as big as Cardiff. We just we just, we, we always yeah, we always base right. things on Cardiff. Man. Yeah, so look, I mean, I don't know why anyone would even ask that question. I mean, Craig is is. Cardiff is his home. You know, we always have an open door for him. Excellent. Uh, but I, I certainly do. I can't speak for others, but I certainly do. And I don't even know him terribly well. Okay, cool. Um, uh, just going to quickly scan through these last couple of comments to see if there's any uh, questions, interesting questions. Oh, uh, uh, Ryan asked, is there any plans to change the red seats uh, in the stadium in the future? Can't afford it. <laughs> I love the honesty. I just, I, I love it. That's what I like. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Mehmet Dalman, thank you very much for your uh, your time and your honesty. I really, honesty. really, uh, really appreciate it's it. It's been fantastic. And uh, Andy, thank you as always. My pleasure. Man. And um, oh, there's uh, just uh, one last question. Um, which I missed through all the questions, and uh, Harry has just nipped on Facebook to ask about it. Uh, so Libby, who had sent in a couple of questions, which I asked regarding the Emiliano Sala thing, uh, not thing, the tragedy, um, she asked about uh, the missing harness of the pilot, um, and basically, have you had any thoughts on that? No, no, no thoughts on that. Okay. And... Uh, uh, Okay. Yeah, I'm. There was one more question which has been asked a few times, and I've missed it. So I just want to get it. Out. Jack Taylor says, uh, uh, "Has there been a failure with the youth setup 
uh, in the last 10 years because we haven't really brought anyone through since Aaron Ramsey. Uh, with the COVID situation financially, could we rely on youngsters coming through to the first team? Well, first part of the question, yes. I, I, I think it's, it's very disappointing over the last 10 years what we've done with the academy. Um, and the answer to the second, I hope so. Is there any uh, special players coming through there, Mehmet, who you can uh, tell anybody who, uh, who might have missed? Obviously, I know there's Cameron Cox, who's, who's played a couple of games this season in the, in the, in the League Cup, sort of, well, the old League Cup, sort of, whatever it's called now, and, and the FA Cup and things. And uh, Anybody else apart from Cameron? Yeah, look, I think we've got a couple of really promising candidates there. Um, and, and I hope that things will happen for them. Um, I, there isn't really much else I can say, but for the first time, it looks promising. Good. Good to know. Great to know. Great news. Excellent. Excellent. Um, thank you to everyone who's tuned in on uh, the various platforms. If I've missed your questions, I apologise. Um, there was a lot today, uh, but I did my best to try and keep up with them. Uh, Andy, thank you for your time. Uh, Pleasure, Mehmet, man. thank you for your time. And uh, Thanks, guys, man. please subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation. That's the most direct uh, way to support the channel and this, this series and our other series. Uh, this Wednesday, we have an interview with Welsh rapper T-Rev on mental health and music, as well as plenty of other shows and series coming up. So keep an eye on our social media. And uh, thank you all. We will see you next Monday for another show. And then, um, Mehmet, you are welcome back absolutely anytime you like because uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Doors always open. Diane Andy, thanks for being great hosts. So, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. It's Andy Campbell. It's in. 